Hello, everybody. Welcome to the class. How are you tonight? Hi, okay. I am really, fine. Nice. Ready for the vacation, I guess. <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, only today we're going to have classes. So the rest of the, the, rest of the week, we are not going to have classes today, so that is something that you need to remember. Okay, and we're going to check about class of tonight. I'm gonna to show you the platform. So this is the class of tonight. There is no homework for tonight, but as I was telling you the other day, you can finish the homework 2.14. Uh, so you just need to go and read the possible conflicts at work and choose the cows. You can choose any of this. And then the second part says, uh, choose the best answer. So you will just check what will be the best solution for this. And also, once you finish that one, you can move on to the midterm test. So remember that the midterm test has four parts. And the first part, you are going to check the uh, the solution for each of these. And for the second one, we're going to, again, type here the whole sentence, okay? It has to be the complete sentence. And let's be careful on this. Remember that uh, one space, one symbol that is not the correct one is going to cause this to appear as not correct, right? Also, on the third part, we need to choose the correct option that is almost exactly as the one that we did before. And on the last part, we are going to check the correct option. So that will be it. So you have a few days for you to finish this part. Uh, and well, just check into that one. If you need, if you have questions about that one, you need help just let me know, and of course, it will be a pleasure to continue helping you on that one, okay? Very good. So we are going to check about the attendance right now. Let's see. Christian Alexander Arevalo Delgado. Daniel Antonio Luna. Present teacher. Good. Daniel Arquímedes Florentino Garcia. Present. Good. Erika Yasmin Martinez Carpio. Present. Good. Fátima Denise Aguilar Márquez. Herman Alexander Durán Linares. Héctor Francisco Morales Rico. Ivan Petrovich Usman Aquino. Present. Good. Jamie Raquel Escobar Alfaro. Present. Present. Good. Holman Saúl Giron Sánchez. Present. Good. Jose Alberto Baños Hernández. Present. Good. Carla Lorena Leiva Contreras. Present. Perfect. Kenia Cecilia Ruiz Morán. Present. Good. Lucy Natalie Juárez de Ramírez. Present. Good. Manuel Antonio Escamilla Jurado. Nelson A. Antonio Rodas Rosales. Present. Good. Osvin Alexis Flores Hernández. Present. Good. Samantha Marisol Campus Flamenco. Present. Good. Zulma Janet Ramirez Avalos. Present. Good. Vanessa Noemi Reyes Lemos. Present. Good. And David Alexander Rodriguez Sanchez. Present teacher. Perfect. Okay, so let's start the class of tonight. We're going to start with a little video. And uh, this is about making decisions that is going to be the topic of tonight. 
right? So as usual, we're going to check the video and check the pronunciation and comment about that. So I'm gonna put this in big and here we go. Next, we've been promised another fireside chat. So you'll see the furniture coming back. Um, but it sounds to me more like a masterclass with another global superstar. Here to discuss the art and science of decision making with Alec Ellison, the founder of Outvest Capital. Please welcome the economist, author, and Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman. So welcome, Danny, or should I say welcome home to Jerusalem. So I want to provide a little bit of background for people on your work by telling a little story. So once upon a time, there were experts in fields ranging from medicine to finance to professional sports scouting. And then along came two professors at the Hebrew University, Danny Kahneman here and his partner Amos Tversky. And they made observations about systematic mistakes we all make as humans. Mistakes you can predict. Effectively, they became connoisseurs of error. Through their work, Danny and Amos became founders and pioneers in the field of behavioral economics. And as you heard, for this work, Danny won the 2002 Nobel Prize in Economics. I could spend our entire time here providing accolades uh, for Danny's work, but I'll, I'll just personalize it. I've read his 2011 bestseller, thinking fast and slow three times. I know that makes you think I'm slow. Uh, and Michael Lewis did a, did a uh, piece, a book called The Undoing Project, which I've read twice, because Michael Lewis felt he had to understand who was behind the change in understanding of how, in, in, in the specific case, if you're familiar with, uh, in professional sports scouting uh, in Moneyball. So Danny, uh, your work has been truly disruptive. People here talk about disruption all the time, but you may be the greatest disruptor we've ever had up on the stage here. So, so, so let's get into our discussion. We have an audience full of investors and entrepreneurs. They all need to make decisions with less than perfect information. Given all the systematic cognitive biases you've documented, how can they make decisions when they are necessarily not fully informed and have to use some intuition? Well, I mean, all decisions are made with only partial information, and, and decisions don't have to, make, to be perfect in order to work. I mean, most decisions are imperfect and they still work. So what we can do is improve things at the margin, and improving things at the margin can be done in multiple ways, and this is what we're studying now. So let's hear, how are some of the ways to improve decisions well, at the margin? You know, there is a question about intuition. Uh, you know, whether you're for intuition or against intuition, it's absolutely clear that intuition can be marvelous, and it's also absolutely clear that intuition is often wrong. And, and there are a few things that we know. We know about the conditions under which intuition is likely to be right. And I think we know something about how to improve it. And we know that it's likely to be right if you've had a lot of experience, and if the word is sufficiently regular for the, that experience to be worth something. So, for example, I do not believe intuition, in intuition in the stock market because the stock market doesn't have the regularity that it takes. But where intuition is worthwhile, is worth having, and it's worth having in many situations, what you really want to do, I think, is to delay it. It's to delay it until you have all the information. The problem with wrong intuitions is they tend to arise very quickly, they tend to be premature. And you are better off if you collect information first and collect all the information in a systematic way and only then allow yourself to take a global view and to have an intuition about the global view. Mm -hmm. This applies in many domains. So take as, delay as much as you can before making that, yeah. that judgment. Okay. Well, let's talk about optimism versus delusion. Um, you view optimism as perhaps the 
most significant cognitive bias we humans have. People overestimate their abilities and they underestimate the odds they face. Yet you view optimism as such a blessing that, and I quote from your book, if you were allowed one wish for your child, seriously consider wishing him or her optimism. So, and you also refer to optimism as the engine of capitalism. So is there a difference between overconfidence and what I'll call healthy optimism? Well, you know, the, in the first place, when you, when you look at great successes, great successes, when you look backwards, were always due to somebody being crazily over-optimistic. Or delusional, even? Delusional, <laughs> actually. Uh, you don't get to big successes without taking unreasonable risks. And so if you look ex ante, the best advice to people is don't do it. But the few people who don't follow good advice, they tend to be responsible for the successes. Most of the people who don't follow good advice don't do very well. So on average, optimism, you know, the kind that leads to great successes, on average, it tends to lead to failure. But the occasional successes, and that's where we, we speak of the engine of capitalism. For society as a whole, it's very good that we have crazy optimists. So we've got a bunch of delusional entrepreneurs in the audience and maybe some delusional investors, but we all benefit as a society. It's kind of almost the opposite of moral hazard in a way. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, a, la a related question is, given that there's so much entrepreneurial activity in the technology field here, how can humans properly assess technology which can move at an exponential pace when we have really been conditioned through evolution to adapt to much slower changes? How do you, how do you think about that dynamic? Well, you know, I think there are many people, futurists like Ray Kurzweil, uh, who believe that, I mean, the fact is that technology seems to be developing exponentially now, people are really not exponential. We have adapted, we are linear, and we are not suited to exponential development. My guess is there's going to be a tremendous amount of dislocation. And the problems, of, are, the problems yeah. are likely to be social, not technological. It's how society is going to, to adjust to that level of technological speed. But do you, do you think in investors, uh, may sometimes underestimate the speed of adoption because of this exponential change when, you, when something really catches on, like the videos we saw a few minutes ago? Well, I mean, you know, it's not, I think that investors as a whole probably overestimate the speed of adoption, but the very successful investing Except for investors our crowd companies. are those who underestimate it. You know, it really depends whether you look at things from, you know, ex ante or ex post, and you get very different pictures. Okay. I want to turn to, um, to the Startup Nation. And I don't think many people here realize the role that Danny has played. How many hands here have been in the Israel Defense Forces? Quite a few. So over 60 years ago, when you were in the IDF, you developed personality tests to replace interviewing, to assess recruits in order to channel them into the proper units and roles. And indeed, as I understand, there was a so-called Kahneman score that people were assigned. And I also understand it was so successful that it survived to the present day with some relatively minor adjustments. So now within the Israeli technology ecosystem, there's a tendency to often to recruit people based on which army units they were in, which means that people are often being recruited based on a test that you developed 60 plus years ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, actually, the. Th it wasn't a test. We, what I did then was to modify the interviewing system. And, and the key idea in the modification, and that was about 63 years ago, was to delay intuition, to make, to make the interviewers collect information on attributes one at a time, and really try not to develop a global view of whether this is going to be a good soldier or not, until all the information was in. And these days, I'm engaged in writing a book about decision-making, where actually uh, our motto is that options in decision-making are very much like candidates, and that there ought to be a way of applying what we know about 
personnel selection, and we know a lot, to decision making in other domains. Now, as I understand, one of the things you were trying to address was interviewers hiring in their own image, correct? So this was a way of turning the judgment into a more of an, what we might call an algorithmic process today, not let the interview know exactly. I mean, actually, you know, that interviewing story that, that you're telling, and my very early experience in psychology, that was my first experience, in psychology is, again, people wanted to, to have intuitions. The previous uh, interviewing system that we replaced was a system where people just talk to the individual and try to form a global impression. And the problem is, when you're interviewing in that way, you form a global impression much too quickly, and the global impression is likely to be wrong. And if you delay forming a global impression, until you collect information on specific topics, you end up with an intuition which is far more accurate. And that was the lesson of 60 years ago, and it turns out that it's been widely accepted in the domain of human resources and personnel selection. And applying it to decision-making more broadly is an interesting exercise, and that's the one in which I'm engaged these days. So, so your message to entrepreneurs who feel a rush to build their teams is to, to really step back and make sure that they're hiring based on whether it's formal tests but, but real data, delay the decisions and not the, the five minute interview. Well, I mean, you know, that advice of being quite systematic about building a field, it turns out that the most successful companies are really doing that and they're investing a great deal. Google, I think, is the is the best example that I know about, about personnel selection, and they are very systematic. They, they spend a huge amount of money on it. They, there are multiple interviews, the interviews are all organized and structured and, and independent, but that's a very important part of good decision making, and is keeping your sources of information uh, as independent as possible. So let's elaborate on this. I think some of your, your current work is on different ways of tuning out the noise. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that? Well, there is an enormous amount of noise in decision making. I mean, we, we became aware of that, of the extent of that actually in an insurance company, in asking by how much do underwriters who look at exactly the same risk differ in their assessments? And we compared that to the expectations of the executives. And the differences among underwriters were about five times as large as expected by the executives. And it turns out that this is true wherever you go. We now have a sort of saying, wherever there is judgment, there is noise. And there is more of it than you think, because people underest overestimate the extent to which others agree with them, and underestimate the amount of the extent of differences very consistently and very systematically. Well, that would suggest in entrepreneurial environments taking the time, or in corporate environments taking the time to, to almost write down areas of agreement to avoid this, this cognitive bias. Well, I mean, you know, the, the one danger in all of this is you don't want to paralyze yourself by too much analysis, and you don't want to paralyze yourself by too many bureaucratic procedures. So finding the best way to combine a disciplined approach to decision making with something that is not too bureaucratic and that decision makers will feel is a help to them rather than a sort of a, a bureaucratic constraint, that's a tough exercise. So changing taxes a slight amount. So the implications of your work uh, have driven the use of algorithms, again, most famously in or most in popular fame in sports, but again in finance, medicine, we talked about zebra technologies earlier, there's been a lot of talk of AI here, it's using of algorithms, 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 and of course there's a potential downside in terms of uh, uh, loss of employment in certain fields, uh, but, but greater employment in others. Do you have a perspective on how fast this might occur or which fields uh, may be the most vulnerable? Well, I mean, you know, this is happening at a tremendous rate. And, it's, and the people who are being displaced and who are at greatest risk of being displaced, I think, are in white-collar professions. Mm -hmm. So there are disciplines that are disappearing. 
dermatology, dermatological diagnosis is going to be done better on the phone than when people do it. Uh, there are forms of cancer that are far better detected by AI than they are by radiologists. Uh, a lot of the legal profession and the legal, the, legal profession. The legal, in the legal field, collecting precedents and collecting relevant laws is something that is going to be automated. So the, the extent of this, very likely I think people are underestimating it and people in the professions involved think they're unreplaceable, but actually more people are going to be replaced than think they are. Um, I have one last question. We talked at the outset of your being one of the greatest disruptors of the last generation. What do you want your legacy to be? <laughs> is it as a disruptor or one who gave us insights that we never understood before? The work is so far ranging. Uh, you know, it's a question I've never asked myself. Uh, <laughs> the, the one thing I would actually like to leave as my legacy is one is a way to change the way that controversies are conducted in my field. And I would like the controversies, I invented the term adversarial collaboration, which is the collaboration between people who disagree on a way of doing things. And not that there is much hope for it, but that's what I would wish my legacy to be. Agreeing disagreeably. Thank you so much, Thank Danny, you. what a pleasure. All right, my friends, what did you get from the video? Any comments or opinions? On the decision making part. Okay, so we're going to check the class. David, could you please, David Alexander, could you please read this paragraph? Okay, teacher. What is decision making? Decision making is simple, the process of making a choice. But decision making often isn't easy and can be particularly complex in an organizational context. Okay, what do you get from this? Um, maybe the the mega the mega as simple is the. Uh, Major, uh, major decision, maybe. Okay, so it's very interesting what you said. Decision making is simple. The process of making the challenges. So it's very simple. You can do this or this. Problem is that sometimes the options are not easy to decide on, right? So. That will be the, the first thing. And that's what it says, but decision making often isn't easy and can be particularly complex in an organizational context. So I remember that we saw a video where a person was saying uh, that most of the people, what they decide sometimes when they have a crisis into the, into the company is to fire people and to sell things and things like that. But to fire people, I mean, that decision is hard, right? You have people that have been working a lot and uh, 
that they have been, uh, I mean, you are going to touch lives right, in a negative way because you are going to get rid of the uh, employees. I mean, decisions like those are, are kind of different, okay? They are no vocabulary words, I guess. Okay, Vanessa, can you please help me with this one? Decisions, decisions. When was the last time you struggled with a choice? Maybe it was this morning when you decided to hit the snow, snow's bottom again. Perhaps it was at a restaurant with a miles long menu and the server standing over you. Or maybe it was when you left your closet in a shambles after trying on seven different outfits before a big presentation. Often making a decision even a seemingly simple one can be difficult. And people will go to great lengths and pay serious sums of money to avoid having to make a choice. The expensive tasty menu at the restaurant, for example, or limit, limit, limiting your closet choice to black turtlenecks, a la Steve Jobs. <laughs> okay. What did you get from this one? Well, um, the, the decision we have to to take it every day, every minute. I think because, um, I think we 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 don't take serious our decision because, uh, for example, in the morning you you sometimes you think I I can sleep five minutes more. But this decision could be could be dangerous because if you do, you get out of the of your house five, five minutes later, so uh, you can get more traffic, so you can get uh, late on your work. So these kind of decisions are are important to to our lives. So. Uh, this kind of decision can change our our life, I think. So uh, every decision that we have to make, we have to to think. Uh, and it depends on the decision. Uh, the result can can be to to improve our life or to get something back. Very good, perfect. So that is so true. Uh, I guess we were saying that before in another classroom. Life is is that is decisions. Every every single thing that you do is a decision. For example, uh, if you want to connect to class, or if you want to connect to the class and I mean just connect and go away and do other things, or if you don't want to participate, or if you uh, I mean you prefer to do one or other thing. Simple things and some complex things, right? Everything is based on decisions. So what you're going to choose, to, are you going to go to a party or are you, going to sleep? are you going to work or are you going to rest? So decisions are part of everything. Okay, and let's check about some things here. It says, uh, when was the last time you struggled? What is struggle? Do you remember? I remember it's like fight. Very good. It's like when you're fighting inside of you about doing or not doing something. So you don't know what to do, right? So uh, with the choices, maybe it was this morning when you decided to hit the snooze. What is hit the snooze? Anybody knows? It's the alarm picture. Very good, Vanessa. Yeah, the, when you hit the snooze is when in the morning when the the alarm is sounding and you wake up and you say, oh, I don't want to get up, right? I'm going to sleep five more minutes. And you click, there are two options. One is discard and the other one is snooze. So when you click snooze, it means that it's going to 
sound again. It's going to ring again in five minutes. So, but in my it says snooze button again. So I know that there are some people that they they are like that well, five more minutes, five more minutes, five more minutes. So and as Vanessa said, that is dangerous, right? Because I mean, imagine, imagine that you are, I mean, you're sleepy, right? Instead of you clicking the snooze button, just click the discard button and you sleep. And the alarm never sounded again. Oh my goodness. So you are, you wake up at nine in the morning, very well have rest, but you are not able to go to job, to your job. So it's a, it's a dangerous, as one to say, decision. Perhaps it was at a restaurant with a miles long menu and the server standing on the queue. So yeah, that is another, sometimes it's difficult, right? When you go to a restaurant, there are lots of things very delicious. I mean, but you can eat one or maybe two things, right? But you cannot eat all of it. So that is uh, another hard decision sometimes. And then it says maybe it, it was when you left your closet in a sh in a shambles. Anybody knows what is shambles? No, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so shambles is a synonym of ruins. So you when you don't have nothing left, something like that. So, uh, yes. I mean, some people, they decide, I'm going to change my classes. I'm going to uh, renew all, uh, all the clothes that I have. So that would be. After trying or seven different outfits before a big presentation. Yeah, that is sometimes difficult, right? When you are there, when you are going to go to a party, for example, and you don't know what to do. So that's sometimes difficult. And it's just after make, making a decision, even a seemingly simple one. Seemingly is like very, a really one, a really simple one in this case. Can be difficult. And people, we go to great lengths. So it's like distances or things like that. And pay serious sums of money. That is also true. What is sums? Anybody knows? It's like a lot of. It's like a lot of. So in this case, it's like a lot of money to avoid having to make a choice. The expensive tasting menu at the restaurant, for example, or limiting your closet choices to black turtlenecks at last Steve Jobs. What is black? What, what are turtlenecks? Do you know what are those? It's a style the the teachers made. Something like that. It's a, a style of shirts, right? Uh, almost always are long sleeves. And the turtleneck is the one that is here, right? The one that is, I don't know how to explain that. It's like, it's very large here, like another sleeve for your neck. And you rock that into your, your neck. So those are turtlenecks. Actually, the ones that Steve just I used to wear. Right? So very simple things. And, and that's it. Okay, do you have any questions here in this part? What do you say? What is seemingly? Seemingly is like a really, really, it's a synonym of really, really, really simple one in this case. Okay, so this one is going to be for, let's see. Daniela Kimbrels. If you ever wrestled with a decision at work, you're definitely not alone. According to McKinsey Research, McKinsey, McKinsey research ex executives spend a significant portion of their time, nearly 40% on average, making decisions worse 
they believe most that the time is poorly used. People struggle with decisions so much so that we actually get excited from having to decide it so much a phenomenon called decision fatigue. Very good. What did you understand on this one? Let me see. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's difficult to get a fast decision because we need to uh, think about the, what could be the result if you uh, has a fast decision. Uh, in, I in my case, when I need to uh, get a decision about a problem, uh, uh, I need to think things a lot of for for the problem. If um, uh, so, a lot of people uh, sometimes uh, make a uh, make a decision so fast uh, when they have a problem in front. Uh, the result is always is wrong is is bad thing i i think okay so yes this is kind of uh i mean at work also there are many decisions to make and sometimes i mean you don't know what to do right crisis there are difficult things uh, decisions about money on money and people so it's, it's difficult so it says if you ever wrestle what is wrestle anybody It's fight, no. Very good. It's like a fight. So wrestle and struggle are synonyms, okay? Wrestle most likely, uh, or most of the times, is going to be more a physical a fight. And struggle is more an internal fight. So, but, I mean, they are synonyms and you can use them one or the other. So wrestle with a decision at work, you're definitely not allowed. According to McKinsey Research, uh, executives spend a significant portion of the time, nearly 40% in mind that on average, making decisions. So, people at work, they, they spend around 40% of all the day making decisions. Do we do this or this other? We put this or this other, so that would be it. Worse, says, they believe most of that time is poorly used. What is poorly? Okay, poorly is like when something is not used in this case, um, not proper. I mean, you have resources and the resources were spent in not a good way. that would be so it says people struggle with decisions so much so that we actually get exhausted from having to decide too much a phenomenon called decision fatigue so there is a name for that one because it's something that actually is, is taking a lot of time a lot of things right so decision fatigue exists uh, and it's because you need to do a lot of things. good do you have any questions on this one? Okay. All right, the next one is going to be for, let's see, Nelson Antonio Rojas. Not possible for him. Let's see, Jamie and Raquel, let's go ahead. Okay. Bad decision fatigue is the fatigue. fatigue. Bad decision fatigue isn't the only cause of ineffective decision making. According to a my cancer survey, survey. of survey 
article more than 1,200 global business leaders in efficient decision making costs are typical for two. By hundred company and by five thousand five hundred five five hundred thirty thousand days of manager times of each year equivalent to about uh, two hundred fifty million in a annual wage wages wages that's a lot of turtleneck how can business leader easy the border of decision making and put this type of and money to better use read on to learn the ins and out of smart decision making and how to put it to work hey what did you understand in the prior Mm, maybe the uh, uh, the people that made that that made decision in whatever company, not all decisions are right because uh, if don't have or, or if don't make a good decision, that can be equivalent to, to wasted money. And so when you waste money, it's an inefficient decision. Something like that. <laughs> okay, very good, thank you. So, yeah, it's very interesting, the numbers here, right? Because now we have figures about what is going on. You might know what it says, but decision fatigue isn't the only cause of ineffective decision. Okay, so that happens when you are not sure what. According to a McKenzie survey, what is a survey, my friends? Like... It's like that. So when you want to know about what's going on, you send sorry. Of more uh, than 1,200 global business leaders. So the survey was made to leaders. Inefficient decision making costs are typical for to 500 company. For a big company, 530,000 days of managers. In my home days, I mean, how many years is that? You know, let's make the math. So it says, let me see. Hold on a second. Uh, I'm gonna check. Here is it. $530,000. What are the days? So that's going to be 1,470. Two years. That is a lot of time, right? And it says uh, the equivalent is about $250 million in annual in one year, only in one year. Wages. What is wages? Anybody else? Okay, wages is like salaries. It's a uh, synonymous salary. That's a lot of talents. That's a joke. How can business leaders ease the burden of decision making? The burden. What is burden? Anybody knows? Okay, burden is like when you are carrying a heavy weight, something power. So that's why it says the easy, the burden of decision making, meaning that to, to release that heavy weight, right? So what's his name in time? 
and money to petty Jews. Okay, and then it says it's the introduction of how to do efficient decision making. That is what we're going to do. check next. One of the things that is happening right now is a lot of companies and people are using artificial intelligence for this to research and probably to make decisions making easier. What do you think about that one? Do you believe that artificial intelligence is something that is really helpful for these kind of situations? What do you think? What is your opinion about that? I think it could be a, a tool in your work to, to, to make work more easier. I think if you, if you find some, some application that can help you in your work. Okay, so yeah, sometimes it's, it's a, a better thing, something like that one, right? Like you are going to have a machine learning program that is going to be possible to train so they can make decisions. But also, okay, this is something interesting because we're saying here that yes, it's a good thing if we use artificial intelligence. But in mind that some companies are actually is happening that they are firing people to get machines with artificial intelligence making the job. I don't remember the name of the company, but there was a company that makes a lot of cars. I mean, one of those companies like Lamborghini or something like that, that they fire people and they have now robots. And the robots, they paint the cars with artificial intelligence and they check if there are some errors and then fix those errors. So that is a decision-making conflict, okay? I have something that is more efficient, it doesn't do any mistakes. Uh, it's easy to use the program. Hey, but I had fire. So that is like a dilemma, right? Something that we need to decide. So it's a very good example of this. All right, next one is going to be for Carla Lorena. How can organization untangle what is what is the pronunciation? Untangle. Untangle ineffective decision make it process. McKinsey research has shown that a hill is the ultimate a hill. It's the ultimate solution for many organizations looking to extremely their decision making. A hill organization are more likely, likely to put decision making in the right hands. Are faster are reacting to or anticipating shift in the business environment and often attract talent who prefer working at companies with greater empowerment and fewer layers of management. 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 Very good, perfect. So what did you understand on this one? Okay, so what it says, how can organizations untangle in effective decision-making processes? Okay, the first question is, what is untangle? Anybody knows what is untangle? No. Okay, untangle is, how can I explain that? I would say that it's desenredar. So that would be that word, untangle. 
So how can organizations untangle ineffective decision-making processes? The problem is that companies, sometimes they have some processes, but they are not efficient. They are not good. So it's very difficult to make a decision because of that, because everything, all the processes, so it's a mess. So that's it. So it says McKinsey Research has shown that Agile is the ultimate solution for many organizations to streamline their decision making. What is streamline? Okay, streamline is like to focus on something like or to give something a better result, something like that. Right? Agile organizations are more likely to put decision making in the right hands, are faster at reacting or anticipating shifts in the business environment, and nothing attract top talent who prefer working at companies with greater empowerment and fewer layers of punishment. So sometimes what it says, all the paragraph is that you don't have to have a complex process. You need to keep that simple, faster. So everything, uh, the information, everything is going to flow in a very fast way. So definitely something that all companies think. Do you have any questions here? Or oh, layers, what is layers? Check it. Anybody knows what layers is? That has been missing. <laughs> yeah, that is it. Different like levels in something, but very good. Whoa, okay, the next one is going to be for let's see. Holman Saudi. For organize organize organizations for organizations looking to become more agile, it's possible to quickly bust the system, making F efficient efficiency efficiency by character. Categorizing, categorizing categorizing the type of decision to be made and adjusting the approach accordingly in the next section we review three types of decisions making and how to optimize the process for each what did you understand here? What is the meaning of quickly Boost. Uh, quickly is fast and boost is something like how can I say that provide power to empower some um. I understand uh, how to organize and, 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 and mm, do fast, fast decisions to, to, to be efficient, the, the decision. And organize and organize the, the decision. Okay, actually, that is it. 
uh, one of the techniques that we can use for us to make better decision making uh, is to organize and categorize the decisions. I mean, this is for budget related, this is about people, this is for this department, this is for this other department. If you do it that way, then you are going to centralize that one and you are going to provide uh, the ability to decide very well to one uh, department, the people that are expert on those. So definitely that is something that is, is gonna work. Uh, let's check vocabulary. For organizations looking to become more agile, it's possible to quickly boost decision-making efficiency by categorizing the type of decision to be made and adjusting the approach accordingly. What is adjusting? Adjusting. Yeah. I understand adjust like fix or Okay, yeah, like adapting, right? Fixing, uh -huh. yeah. Very good, perfect. In the next section, we'll review three types of decision making and how to optimize the process of each. So let's see the three types of decision making. Okay, so uh, Fatima, can you please hand me the links? What are three guides to faster, better decisions? Business leaders today have access to more sophisticated data than ever before, but it hasn't necessarily made this made decision making any easier. For one thing, organizational dynamics. Dynamics. Such, dynamics, such as unclear rules. Over reliance, over reliance, over reliance on consensus, and that that by committee, committee uh -huh. can get in the way of a straightforward decision making, and more data often means more decision to be taken, which can become too much for one person, team or department. This can make it more difficult for leaders to cleanly delegate, which in turn can lead to a decline in productivity. productivity. Good, what did you understand here? I I think um it's important uh, the actualization of that that data when used for make decisions and how uh, the information uh Need for actual, for the actually, or the mo in the moment in in when he need the 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 make the important decision. Very good, perfect. So uh, it says business leaders today have access to more sophisticated data than ever before. That is true. Nowadays, data is. You can say data or data, that is not important. Uh, it's very sophisticated. Imagine, for example, Facebook, right? A Facebook, they analyze people around the world, preferences, what you click on, what you liked, what you didn't like, uh, things like that one. And they analyze people so they can offer marketing. So that would be, uh, but to analyze that data from everybody, that is not that easy. For one thing, organizational dynamics, uh, such as unclear roles, over reliance. What is over reliance, my friends? Hmm. 
Okay, let's start with reliance. Do you know what is reliance? Okay, reliance is like trust. And over reliance is when you trust too much on consensus and that by comedy, meaning that yeah, you trust too much in the archaic way of making decisions. Now we get together and we decide, but sometimes it's not the correct decision, right? Even when we are a lot of people there specializing in one field. And then it says, and more data often means more decisions to be taken, which can become too much for one person, team, or department. This can make it more difficult for leaders to clearly delegate which in turn can lead to decline the property. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if one team, for example, is saying something that is very important, sometimes they don't have enough data, they are not able to analyze it. That, one of the most common examples of this is the politics, right? So they decide, they change laws, they change things in a country, Sometimes the changes are not good because they don't have the right decision, but they don't have the right decision because sometimes that decision is too much, too complicated for a group of people. You need something else. So it's not going to be good enough now. Do you have any questions here in this uh, paragraph? Teacher, um... yeah. what... Uh, refer this paragraph with date by committee. Committee. Committee, yeah. Uh, it's, it's exactly that one. I mean, uh, the most common way for people or a company to make a decision is that they get together. That is like the committee, right? Uh, you get together and then uh, you decide something. But just because you feel that is the correct decision. But sometimes it's not the correct decision. You need to research and analyze more data. It's not just, I believe that this is what we have to do. No, we need to check the facts. We need to check the numbers. We need to analyze trends. We need to go and make some regressions. So all of those are important for us to make a very good decision. And sometimes in a committee, in a meeting of people, you are not able to do that. So that is the meaning of that. Um, which means straightforward. Very good question. That is something that we didn't check. The straightforward is something direct. Okay, I don't say too many things. I say what I have to say direct. In this case, speaking about decision making, something that is, I mean, easy. I need to do this. So I need to decide this or this. But again, when people get together, they analyze, they speak too much, they over say things, and then don't make the right decision. So straightforward is like direct. Any other question? No more questions. Okay, next one is for Nelson Antonio Arrodas. Oh, I believe he was not possible for me. I remember. Okay, Daniel Antonio Luna. Okay, teacher. Leaders are growing increasingly, increasingly, great. Increasingly. Increasingly, okay, thank you. With great with broken decision making process. The slow deliberation deliberation. Deliberation. Deliberation in unique decision making outcomes. You were than half of the one thousand two hundred respondents at of a McKinsey survey report that decisions are timely and 61% say that at least half the time they spend making decisions is ineffective. What did you understand here? 
Ok. Um, the most people, of, the most of people uh, who are leaders, they will be frustrated because um, the decision was he he decide is uh, ineffective. Ineffective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my. <laughs> okay. So, yes. Very good. Perfect. So, uh, yes, it says students are growing increasingly frustrated. Increasingly is like more, right? With broken decision making processes, slow <laughs> deliberations and uneven decision-making outcomes. Uneven, do you know what is uneven? Okay, uneven is not balanced. So you are not being objective when you are making decisions. Outcomes, what is outcomes? Resource. Mm, it's not resource. It's like when you have a process and you do a certain steps, there is an income that you put into the process and an outcome that is the result. So in this case, it's like the result of the process of decision making. Fewer, what is fewer? A little. A little, very good. Just a few, right? Uh, fewer than half of the 1,200 respondents of our McKinsey survey report that decisions are timely. Okay, what is timely? Timely. That is in a... It's in a period of time. Okay, very good, on time. When it's in a very good period of time. So when you did exactly what you have to do things, the time, the time when you have to. And then it says, and 61% said that at least half the time they spend making decisions is in effect. So yes, decisions are made, but it's not ex the best way to, to decide. Any questions here in this paragraph? Okay, next one is going to be for Samantha Marisol. Okay, uh, what's the solution? According to McKinsey Research, Effective solution centers around categorizing decision types and organizing different processes to support each type. Further, each decision's category should be assigned its own practice, stimulating debate, for example, debate, debate sorry, for example, or in Employing employees to yield mm -hmm. improvements in effectiveness. Good. What did you understand on this part? Sorry, I can't. I can't get it. Okay, let's check it out. So it says, what the solution then if we are not making very good decisions? According to McKinsey Research, effective solution center around categorizing decision types and organizing different processes for each type. So according to this uh, person, two things are important when you make, uh, when you are trying to do a decision making. Uh, first is, um, categorizing and second one is organizing the processes to support each type of decision so 
is not only to categorize which department is going to make that process of decision making, but what process is going to be made. Because sometimes not all the decisions that you have to make is going to be analyzed the same way. Okay. For it says its decision category should be assigned its own practice. Again, it's not going to be the same process for every decision maker. Stimulating debate, oh, that is very important, debate, pros and cons. For example, or empowering employees to GL improvements in effectiveness. Do you remember what is GL? We checked that word already. I don't know if you remember. What is GL? You say efficient. Efficient. Yeah, yeah. something like the way that you perform something. Very good. All right. So uh, do you have any questions here? Good. This one is going to be for... Uh, Lucy Natalie. Hi, teacher. Hello. Here are the three decision categories that matter most to senior leaders and the standout practice that makes the biggest difference for each type of decision. Big bad decisions are infre infrequent but high risk, such as acquisition. I'm sorry. Um, acquisitions. I don't know. Acquisitions, thank you. These decisions carry the potential to shape the future of the company. And as a result, are generally made by top leaders and the board, spurring productive debate by assigning someone to our the cause for an, and against a potential decision can improve big bad decision making. Very good. What did you get? This um. I think that is an advice to make a, a certain decisions in the companies for uh, for a better better results. Okay, that is it. I mean, it's going to be like well, it says. Let's analyze all. Uh, there are three decision categories. It says. That matter most of the senior leaders stand out. What is a stand out? Okay, it's the stand out practice means something that is going out, something that it shouldn't be the same way that we do all the time. So that makes the biggest difference for each type. And it says big bad decisions are infrequent but high risk. So big bad is things that you are going to decide. But if you take the bad decision, it's going to impact negatively a lot into your company. So for example, when you decide to buy another company, that is a big bad decision because it's a Oh, you know, big bet is como una apuesta grande. So you are going to decide on do or not to do something very big. So that way. Acquisitions. What is acquisitions? Okay, acquisition is when you get something. When you acquire something, when you buy something or, or get something, right? It says these decisions carry the potential to shape. What is shape? Some are figures, shape, different shape, right? No ones. Very good. Depends, Actually, depending on the context. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Actually, that is it. Shape is like when you draw something. So the potential to shape the future of the company. So uh, the meaning of this part is says that depending on your decisions, that is going to be the future that you are going to give. 
to the company and it's going to base, be based on the decision-making process. And as a result, are generally made by top leaders and the board. Spurring, do you know what is spurring? The spurring is something that is like urge, something that you, when you provide encouragement to some or somebody, that is spurring. So in this case, spurring is like encouraging productive debate by assigning someone to argue. But do you know what is argue? It's a it's game like... argument. Mm -hmm. An argument, a discussion about something. The case for and against, that is very important. Uh, you decide and you decide, or uh, you check uh, what is for and what is against doing something. Do you know what is against? It's like um, bears. <laughs> very good, that is it. Exactly. This is very similar to versus, like uh, enemies or anything like that. That potential decision can improve big, bad decision making. So this is the first category. This category is big, bad decisions, meaning that there are decisions that are going to impact the company in a large way, in a negative or positive way, in a very large way. So we need to be careful about those because probably is going to decide the future of the whole company. And we need to be, be aware of that. Questions in this parallel? Next one is for Ivan Petrovich. Present. Yeah, are you able to read? I have I have a problem in the out in the in the my in the Zoom teachers. Ah, okay, okay, no problem. Okay. Uh, Osvin Alexis. Okay. Ross, current decision such as pricing can be frequent and higher risk. These are usually made by business unit head in cross-functional forum as part of a collaborative process. This type of a, of a decision can be improved by doubling down on process refinement the ideal process should be one that help clarify adjectives, measures, and targets. Okay, what do you get from this? Um, uh, I understand that when you put a uh, a price uh, can be uh, can be high risk okay okay so the second category of decision making is cross current decisions okay what are those decisions for example pricing what is the price that you are going to give to a a product that is important, not as important as the big uh, one that we checked before, but it's also important because it's going to impact the business. People are going to decide to buy your product if the price is good, or if it's too high, the price, then you are not going to be able to check that one, right? And so it can be frequent and high risk. Uh, these are usually made by business unit heads. So this is not for the top leaders, but for the medium side, right? 
in cross-functional farms as part of collaborative processes. So what they do is that they do some meetings between the departments. That is a cross-functional forum. When the selling department with the productive department, with the marketing department, with the warehouse, they get together and they try to decide what is the best option for this product. Uh, and then it says, well, these types of decisions can be improved by doubling down on process of finance. So we need to refine, we need to put attention into details so the decision is made correct. And then it says the ideal process should be one that helps clarify objectives, measures, and targets. What are measures? Okay, a measurement is like a unit that helps you quantify something. For example, a cup of coffee, a meter, a kilometer, those are measures. Targets, what is targets? It's similar to objectives. Similar to objectives, very good, perfect. Any questions in this paragraph? No questions. Very good. Next one is going to be for Erica Yasmin. Not possible, Erica. Sulma Ramirez. Uh, delegate decisions are frequent, but low risk and are handled by an individual or working team with some input from others. Delegate decisions making can be improved by ensuring that the responsibility for the decision is firmly in the hands of those closest to the work. This approach also enhances enhances engagement and accountability. What did you understand on this one? Uh, that the person that work with the, that is with the teams close to the, the work that they do, they have to take the decisions frequently. That is true. So in the lowest part of the management, there are these kind of decisions. So delegated decisions are frequent but low risk. So that is, I mean, you make decision, but it's not going to impact the business in a very large way and then handled by an individual or working team with some input from others. So yes, they sometimes get together with other people, it's not that common. Delegated decision-making can be improved by ensuring that uh, their responsibility for the decision is firmly and in the hands of those closest to the work. This approach also enhances Engagement and accountability. What is enhances, everybody? Okay, it's like, uh, how can I say? Like highlight. Enhances is like highlight, uh, like encouraging, right? Something like that one. All right, uh, any questions on this paragraph? Your approach is like rich. It's like? Rich. Uh, it could be something like that one. It's like the way that you face a situation, a problem, or anything like that. 
Any other question? Okay. Let's see the next part. Oh, let's see. Jose Alberto Baños. Yes, teacher. Uh, yeah. Are you able to read? Yes, but it's, it starts raining here. It's, uh, um, I will try. Okay. Okay. Okay, in addition, business leaders can take the following four actions to help sustain rapid, rapid decisions making. Focus on the game changing decisions, ones that will help an organization create value and serve its purpose. Convene only necessary meetings and eliminate lengthy reports. Turn unnecessary meetings into emails and watch productivity bloom. For necessary meetings, provide short, uh, well prepared pre-reels to aid in decision making. Clarify the roles of decision makers and others' voice. And who has a vote and who has a voice? Push decisions making authority uh, to the front line and tolerate mistakes. Good. What did you understand on this one? Um, well, um, I think is more for uh, what can I say? Ahorrar? Save. Sorry? Save. Save. Yes. Save. Yes, for save save uh, the most possible time or the more possible time. Uh, eliminate the 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 poor time or the 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 yeah, it wrote something like that. And uh, we when we take uh, when we have a, a mini. If it's not really uh, important, the make the meaning in presentially, you can do it virtually. And the the with the others uh, type of 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 um, means for to for the for to make a decision. Uh, something like that is necessary to uh, make a, a meeting and you can send an email or or something uh, quickly, I guess. Very good, perfect, thank you. So yes, efficiency, right? That is the key of this part. And the good thing is that says that we have four actions that we can help we can do in our companies or processes or anything like that so we can uh be agile that is the word for the whole thing right first one is focus on the game changing decisions ones that will help an organization create value and serve its purpose so yeah there are things that you need to decide but they are not that relevant so don't think that too much so the ones that you need to think very much is going to be the ones that are going to actually cause you uh, value. It's going to generate value. The next one says convene only necessary meetings. Oh, this is a big problem. Because in a lot of companies, we have meetings three, four, five meetings a day. I mean, but you didn't decide anything. It's like, you had the meeting and nothing happens to the company, right? So that is not necessary. I mean, why are you meeting that much if you are not going to add value to the company or the processes or anything? Okay, and it says, 
eliminate, eliminate a lengthy reports. Lengthy is like long, long reports, reports that are not that good, right? The third one says turn unnecessary minutes into emails. Also, this is amazing. Sometimes you just need to send an email. Do you prefer this or this? And that's it, right? You don't have to go to a meeting and discuss 40 minutes, one hour about something just to decide between one or two things. So not, not good. And then it says, uh, watch productivity bloom. What is bloom, anybody? Okay, this is something that comes from the plants, right? Uh, when you have a plant and they are giving flowers, that is called bloom. So it's blooming. In this case, it's uh, like the product process. Uh, for necessary meetings, provide short, well-prepared pre-reads to aid in decision making. What is aid? The A is to help. It's a synonym of help. Okay, and what it says is also very important. Uh, yes, sometimes you need to meet. There are meetings that are necessary. But if that is the case, it has to be short, not that long. And you need to send via email before the meeting uh, what is about, what you have to read, what you have to analyze or prepare. So when you come to the meeting, it's going to be just for you to decide. You don't have to discuss the history or what happened to one or the other thing, but only to decide, okay? Ask questions and that's it. All right, We're very interesting this paragraph. So clarify the roles of decision makers and other voices. Also, this is very important because yes, maybe some people are going to participate in their meeting to decide something but the ones who decide are certain people certain people. so those are the ones that we need to focus on and tolerate mistakes yeah there are going to be mistakes but we need to uh, learn from the mistakes and create something better right good good any questions here What is convene, teacher? Uh, convene is like when you have, when you agree on something, you have an agreement. Any other question? No more questions. All right, so that is it. Okay, interesting because decision making is something that we really uh, need to improve. I believe that in Latin America, this is a very big problem. Sometimes it's, I mean, not that. Okay, uh, we're going to adapt this into the real life. I'm going to give you a scenario. And then in groups, you are going to decide what would be. You are going to make a decision about this. Okay, so imagine this, we have a company. We are part of a company. And this company has a crisis. I mean, we are very bad. The economical situation of the company is very bad, very bad. So what we can do, we can fire people. We can uh, sell some part of the company. We can sell shares. Uh, we can try to get some investment from other people. There are many things that we can get a loan from the bank. So what would you do? That is the question. If you are part of a company that has a crisis in economics, 
we don't have enough money and we need to pay salaries, we need to do a lot of things. So what you are going to do is to create a strategy. They say, decide in groups, I'm going to create some breakout rooms for you to analyze the situation and then provide a solution, okay? Do you have any questions about the activity? Okay, so I'm going to create the breakout room right now. Let's see how it goes. Second. All right, here we go.
Okay, let's check together. On the first group, it was Daniel Arquimedes, Fatima Denise, Lucy Nathalie, and Sur Martes. Who is going to speak? Uh, ladies first. Okay. In the company, the um, Daniel Arquimedes uh, ha has the problem for the space in the in the office, mm -hmm. and the solution is create a spaces recreative space mm -hmm. in the garden or for for lunch for the employees. Okay. Okay, very good. Perfect. That sounds very nice. Anything else? So that is it. No, but Vanessa is the other, I think. Okay. They has uh, the possible pro the, the problem and they she has a solution too. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the problem for the, the my classmates say that um in the in the in his in her company having enough space uh, uh some co-worker prefer to uh, go to the bus because they having enough space to park it to to get a parking uh, in my case that Fatima say that we have a, a, a big problem, but because uh, we have enough space for the employees when they need to get a lunch, they have enough space. But because they prefer to eat in a garden, in a jar, but it's unhealthy to eat because there is a lot of fly and mosquitoes and frog because it's in a big space, but um, uh, the, the company, uh, is uh, let me see. Mm, it's very uh, with a doctor. How do you say, teacher? Careful. Careful about the garden, but the the employees prefer to eat in a floor and not don't use at uh, the cafeteria tables. Uh, this space, but it's specific for it. It's a, it's a problem why I think it's for education. Or oh, I don't know why. But I, I think it's more, uh, let me see, comfortable. It belongs of the the street, the tree, uh, prefer, prefer to eat belongs of the tree that, that, than it's in a cafeteria, I think. Okay, very good. Perfect. Thank you very much. Interesting. Um, yeah. On the next group was Jamie, Raquel, Holman, Saúl, José Alberto, and Christian. Uh, can I have a little few minutes? Maybe can pass over the group. Okay, yeah. Uh, then Daniel, Antonio, Erika, Jasmine, Carla, Lorena, and Vanessa. Lane.
with the chair. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of ideas. So if the company wants to to pass the pro the economic problems, first we we think that they have to investigate for what is the principal reason that the company got in financial trouble. In order to solve it, it could be for high cost. So the company ha has has to to find what is the what is the problem and look for the solutions then verify how how much money the company has for for pay the debt the debts with the suppliers a request if it's necessary to with the shareholders for money to continue the operation of the company and maybe look for new st strategies with the target market to sell all the, the products that the company ha has. And if it's necessary, ask for help to a, a financial consultant, then decide to, to save money and find some way to increase the, the invest. And the last one that we have is create a partnership with other investors in order to increase the company and, and improve the, the situation. In order that the company don't, don't, doesn't get bankruptcy. Very good, yes. nice analysis. I really liked it, so it was very good. Okay, the last group was uh, David Alexander and Nelson Rodas. I don't know if you made something. Okay, so that not. So, uh, Jose Alberto, I don't know if you're ready or we can leave it like that. Okay. Yes, Uche. Okay. Uh, maybe can I uh, share on the screen? Yeah, of course. Okay, so let me a few minutes, uh, just a moment. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. We uh we are thinking about uh, the company. We have a a boutique and our company is in, in crisis, but we thinking about uh, some solutions. And the first one is limit the expenses. Uh, the number two is increase the sales, prioritize current customers because we need to, to care our customers and Number four, create alliance with other companies. That is a, a next uh, a strategy for uh, for increase the sales. But we need to create a new advertising strategy. And with uh, the number six is stabilize uh, stabilize income and expense and ask for a loan with uh, the last uh, possibility for the solutions. Okay, That's very good. Okay. Very nice, very good analysis. So very good, my friends. So making decisions, as we say, sometimes is, is not easy. Here, I mean, it's not true. We can say we can do this and this other, but to really design sometimes. Okay, let's check the attendance and then let's go to bed. So, Christian Alexander Arevalo. Daniel Antonio Present. Luna. Good. Good. Daniel Arquimedes Florentino Garcia. Present. Good. Erica Jasmine Carpio. 
Present. Good. Fátima Denise Aguilar Márquez. Present. Good. Herman Alexander Durán Linares. Eh, Héctor Francisco Morales Rico. Iván Petrovich Guzmán Aquino. Present. Good. Jamie Raquel Escobar Alfaro. Present. Good. Holman Saúl Girón Sánchez. José Alberto Baños Hernández. Present. Good. Carolina Leiva Contreras. Present. Good. Eh, Kenia Cecilia Ruiz Morán. Lucy Natalie Juárez de Ramírez. Present. Good. Manuel Antonio Escamilla Jurado. Nelson Antonio Arroda Rosales. Osvin Alexis Flores Hernández. Okay. Good. Samantha Marisol Campos Flamenco. Surma Janet Ramírez Ramírez. Present. Good. Vanessa Noemí Reyes Lemos. Present. Good. David Alexander Rodríguez Sánchez. Present teacher. Perfect. So my friends, remember that tomorrow no class until next Monday. So have a very good uh, vacation. Be careful on the beach and see you after the vacation. Dream in English. Thank okay, you, teacher. Thank you. Good night, nice everyone. Vacation. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you, teacher. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.